can we talk about the way that you go about measuring this data? You know, in fact, in fact, how how are you remunerated? Who gives you money to exist? How does it work? Well, we're we're owned by the gold mining companies. They they formed us, I think, now thirty three or thirty four years ago. Yeah, and uh, and they're there to uh, and they, uh, sorry, and they um, they sponsored us on the basis of the, the the amount of gold that they produced. So for each ounce of gold that they produced, they gave us a certain amount of money, and uh, to to fund us to develop the gold market. And uh, you know, times have moved on. I mentioned before that we were instrumental in bringing the exchange traded funds, uh, gold backed exchange traded funds to the market. And because uh, we were involved in uh, the, the management of, uh, of two of the big exchange traded funds, um, we get some revenue from there as well. So we're no longer wholly dependent on contributions from members. We, it's a mixture of the two. So it is unbiased uh, research, unbiased, not necessarily advice, but. Um, information on gold market. Are, sure. are you in any any way influenced by outside groups to push gold um, when perhaps you shouldn't be? Well, let's put it this way. Um, I've got a when I joined the World Gold Council three years ago. I've been in this industry for thirty two years. Uh, the only the only reason I joined here, or the, the sort of number one condition that I had when I joined the World Gold Council, is that I would allow, be allowed to be um, objective. You know, when you're producing data about gold demand uh, and gold supply and what's happening and what's happening in various markets, you know, there's no point producing data when it's made up. You have to be objective. And I'll give you an example. Um, we came out with our uh, gold demand trends uh, report, which is a quarterly report we produce uh, looking at, at, at uh, primarily demand, but also a little bit on supply. So we came out with our first quarter gold demand trends number. And, and I'm just looking through the headlines here. I've, I've got the report up from uh, uh, from Gold Hub. Um, the pandemic slashed jewelry demand as governments across the globe imposed lockdown measures. Demand fell to the lowest on record, a 65% decline in China. We're not trying to sugarcoat uh, what happens in the market. There are good things that happen. There are bad things that happen in terms of our data and our analysis on this. We are objective as we can be. Okay. No, that you've actually hit upon the next question, which was traditionally, um, I, I used to, when I was banking, did a lot of business in India, India and China, both huge gold consumers yes. on, on jewellery and as a means of, of saving. It's, it's kind of, um, I think, it, when, when there's a bull market, people go, oh, what, you know, what, what, why go to the antiquated measure of hoarding, you know, small amounts of gold under your mattress at home? Uh, and then times like times when times are a little bit tougher, or what people suspect may be coming down the line, um, it, it's it's in vogue again. It's absolutely in vogue again. But as you say, so China's been affected on the jewelry market, as as has India. Um, is, is, do you think that is going to after we get through this kind of COVID lockdown period, it's going to be a resurgence of buying again? Are we going to get back to the norms of before? Eventually, I expect, um, depending on where the price is, but it won't necessarily be quickly. If you think about what happened in the first quarter, we had China going into lockdown first because that's where the virus seemed to affect um, first. Um, so the China market was affected most in the first quarter. And now we're seeing the Chinese economy coming out of lockdown and, and jewelry demand is, uh, has, well, has, has improved from a very low level, but it's not growing rapidly at the moment. In fact, I'd argue that if you compare it to other aspects of the Chinese economy, it's lagging somewhat. So, it, you know, I expect, I expect sequential improvements there, but I don't care how fast it improves. 2020 will be a poor year for Chinese jewellery. In the case of India, first quarter wasn't great anyway, and the lockdown mostly will affect the second quarter. I mean, I was talking to our managing director in Mumbai um, you know, earlier today on a, on a weekly call we have. And, uh, and, you know, he says, yes, the, the, the Indian economy is uh, opening up again. But again, we're not expecting um, a, a very rapid increase or very rapid recovery in, in, in jewelry demand uh, from India and China. And in fact, if you look across the numbers for the entire world, I think there was one country that actually showed year on year improvements in jewelry demand in, 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 uh, in the first quarter. And that's for very technical reasons for something that was happening last year. So it's not going to be a strong year for, for jewelry. But in a way, this is one of the advantages of the gold market. Uh, many commodity markets are one-trick ponies. So they genuinely are 
boom to bust. I was going to use other mining expressions then, but I probably shouldn't. Um, things go very, very well because of demand for auto catalysts in petrol cars. And I'm thinking palladium here. Um, so that, that goes off to the moon. And then there's a switch over towards more diesel vehicles that took place. And, uh, and then suddenly palladium is out of favor and it crashes back again. So um, there are a, a lot of um, a lot of commodities, indeed a lot of assets, which, which are dependent upon a very narrow range of drivers. Gold's much more balanced. You've got investment demand, you've got jewelry demand, you've got central bank demand, you've got technology demand. So you know, pretty much every electronic good that you have has gold in it in some forms or another. And, and the big two, investment and jewelry, they tend to vie for dominance depending on what's going on in the world. So jewelry demand, very much driven by economic growth, prosperity, particularly in the emerging markets that really uh, drive gold demand. So historically, India, now over the last few years, more so China, but you, you name the countries, uh, Turkey, Indonesia, lots, of, lots of, uh, uh, of, of demand coming from there. Investment demand is more Western centric in general. We, we're seeing development of investment markets in, in some emerging markets, but generally speaking, it's a, it's a Western phenomenon. Uh, and that tends to do well when economic growth is weaker. And so the fact that jewelry demand has collapsed at the moment, uh, partly because of the, uh, uh, the coronavirus, partly because of the, the rapid increase in the price, that's uh, absolutely normal. Gold's being driven up by investment and speculation. So that's come to the fore and become the dominant market. Now, we will come out of this current coronavirus crisis. It might take a few years for the global economy to recapture the levels that it saw back in 2019, um, but it will re it will recover. I'm sure these viruses will eventually be brought under control, either by vaccines or drugs or, or, or whatever. At that stage, I would expect to see investment demand as the component of the total decline, and jewelry demand picking up again. So very much, you know, what what I'm talking. You you know when investment demand is weak because I spend a lot of time talking about what's going on in the Indian. Uh, and the Chinese physical markets. And you'll know uh, when jewelry demands weak because I'm talking about ETF inflows and bar and coin buying in the West. <laughs>